Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host Mark Fusco here for another episode of the show. Now, um, this show is going to be all about Chardonnay because uh, we're going to drink some Chardonnay or taste some Chardonnay and then we're going to talk about Chardonnay in the third segment. So, the um, reason I did this, well, I have a couple Chardonnays in the house that I've had for a while um, and uh, we are talking one end to the other. So, let's get right into it, all right? We'll talk about what Chardonnay is and all the, all the stuff about it. Uh, in a little bit, but let's get right into this wine first. We do a little rinse first to get all that red wine from the earlier, from last week's show, out of there. And then uh, we're going to talk about this one. Now this is, I think it's a non-vintage, right? Yeah, this is the non-vintage Cul-de-Sac Wine Company Chardonnay from California. Now, longtime viewers of the show know that I've tried two other wines from Cul-de-Sac. I bought all three wines at the same time, uh, actually from Central Market, uh, coincidentally enough, from HEB. Um, this is kind of the HEB house brand, and it's $2.99 or $3.99 a bottle. I can't remember. I'll, I'll make sure I check for sure what it is. Uh, I'll probably look at one, an old episode to see what it, what it was, but they're, they're all the same price. So I'll be in the lower third by now. So... Um, so this is one of those wines where nobody can tell you anything about it. It's just, you know, some bulk wine that HEB bought, slapped the label on it. You know, there's some, well, not, not HEB, but some company slaps the label on some bulk wine and they're selling it for super cheap. It's kind of like, you know, uh, HEB's answer to Two Buck Chuck uh, or Charles Shaw. You know, it's more than $2 in some other places. Like, I think it's $3 here. I think it's or $3.99 here. Um, no, it might be $2.99. Uh, another place in the country, it's three ninety nine. So it's anywhere from two, three, and four dollars a bottle. Um, uh, was it Oak Hill is Walmart's version? There's some other chains that have these types of entry level wines um, that some people love, some people meh, are mad about it. So matter of fact, <clears throat> I talked about this wine recently at work, and one of my servers was like, "Oh, I love that wine." Now I don't know which wine she had, but I can. I looked at her kind of like, okay. So with that said, uh, I've already granted had two of the wines, did not like them. So let's see how the Chardonnay stands up. As far as color and all that, well, you know, it's definitely gold in color like most Chardonnays would be. Um, clear. Uh, so we're, we're, not, we're dealing with, you know, wine that was filtered and all that, so it should be. Um, there's a hint of green to it. Let's check out the nose. Well, off the nose, I get what I should probably get off of a Chardonnay. I get a little bit of, actually, apple to it. A little bit of butteriness to it. But it's really, really light on the aroma. Not intense at all. Really get kind of that... You know, I, I get these aromas, but it's kind of like more like the, the peel rather than the actual, like, fruit. But, you know, it's there. A little bit of floral to it, like white flowers. Uh, no, no overt evidence of wood or uh, earthiness or minerality out of it. Well, it's a wine. If I was scoring, you'd get at least 50 points, but every wine gets 50 points, right? At least. I don't know about scoring it. Oh, uh, you know what? On the palate, it's 
it, it's, you know, it's a classic example. If it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it must be a duck. It smells like Chardonnay, tastes like Chardonnay, must be a Chardonnay. It tastes like a Chardonnay. Um, no surprise there. Uh, it's got that, though know, it's, it's, it doesn't have that overt buttery popcorn type of flavor to it. It definitely feels like it's um, not gone through the malolactic fermentation, or maybe if it did, it wasn't, there's still some malic acid to it, because I still get kind of that, the apple type of uh, fl flavor profile. I don't get a lot of tropical fruits, though, so uh, that might be something I would expect. But you know, it's, I'll be honest, it's not bad. And we know that I'm not a huge Chardonnay fan, but I've had some Chardonnays that are three times the price of this one. And I was like, yeah, okay. This isn't bad at all. For $3, which is, I remember right, this how much this costs, buy it. This is the first one I've recommended of the other three. I think the Chardonnay I hated. The Merlot, I was kind of like, eh, it's all right, you know? If you want some cheap wine, you know, bring somewhere and, and you're not spending a lot of money on alcohol yet, buy it. This was not bad. I, I would, especially for the price, I'd recommend it. Now, I just, these, these wines are a little bit chilled. They're probably not as cold as they're supposed to be. Uh, I've been recording for almost two hours now and these lights are standing up, which means I gotta go really quick because they're about to go out, I'm sure. Up, oh, up, oh, up, oh. there's a little bit of butter. A little bit of buttery to this, buttery to this, but butteriness to it. Um, but yeah, it's really, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of apple -y. It's definitely fruit forward. It's got a medium amount of acid. Um, there's maybe a touch of caramel to it. So not quite a caramel apple flavor, but I've had some other, from some other Chardonnays that are really tasty. But you know, it's basic, it's simple. It's, it's, it, it is what it is. It doesn't pretend to be anything else. Um, it gets the job done. What, what, other, what other phrases can I use to equate the same thing? For $3, if you want a white wine that is pleasant to drink, that is something that you could easily you know, chill, drink, put it with whatever food that Chardonnay will go well with, um, you know, light foods, um, definitely drink it. Like I said, I've had some of the Chardonnays that are way more expensive that I was like, yeah, it's okay. But this one, if I was in the mood to buy an a inexpensive Chardonnay again, I wouldn't hesitate to buy it. No, it doesn't mean I would run out to the store and buy it, but I would recommend it. Check it out. You might like it. All right, we're going to move on to wine number two. It's really quick for once, but it should be this. It should, I shouldn't go more than eight to ten minutes on a wine. So we're gonna to go to wine number two. I'm really excited about this one. All right, so moving on to wine number two. Now, this wine I found uh, found out about, I forgot how, but what was so intriguing about this bottle, about this wine is the bottle. Um, it is something that nobody else is, does, which is kind of good because then it would kind of lose its uniqueness. But it's a, it's a ceramic bottle. Now, it looks like it's cement. It looks like a concrete, but it's actually a ceramic bottle, but it's made to look like that. And it's done that way on purpose to make it look like, or to, to, to kind of give you the idea that this wine is not oak aged, or there's no oak touches this wine. It is fermented and aged in steel, stainless steel and cement, okay? So, uh, which most people know that that's the preference to my, uh, for my Chardonnays. Uh, this is the two, so let's enough talk about that. This is the Mer Soleil Silver Unoaked Chardonnay 2010. Uh, it's a heavy bottle too. I did buy this also at HEB Central Market. I almost said World Market. It's a little rinse. Um, HEB Central Market. Uh, I don't remember the exact price, but the average price is around $23. So this is definitely an over $20 bottle of wine. I might have gotten it for $19, like... 1999 or 95 or whatever. Um, I seem to remember it being just just like a few cents under $20. Um, 
but I definitely was interested in getting this wine. Now, the people who make this wine, this is one of those where, you know, an industry that has a lot of connections with everybody, knows each other, and not necessarily intermarries, but they work with each other at some point in time, and they, they all help each other out. Um, this is d definitely one of those families. Um, so the, the Wagner family is behind this, and they started with winemaking, uh, or they, they started farming grapes and producing wine in 1915 in Napa Valley. So throughout the years, uh, they've been involved with winemaking. Uh, Charlie Wagner and Lorna Bella Gloss Wagner, yes, that one, um, or Bell Gloss, I guess is actually how it's pronounced, how it's pronounced not Bella. Um, along with their son Chuck, established Camus Vineyards in 1972. Um, so Chuck saw great potential producing quality wines that sat out of Napa Valley. In 1988, he began planting land uh, in the Santa Lucia Highlands. Uh, it's located in Monterey County. Uh, so it's along the cooler coastline, it yielding early ripening Chardonnay. So they started Marisolet, uh, Chardonnay, and then um, uh, Charlie, uh, the son of them, uh, began, uh, decided to create the unoaked Chardonnay, which is this, the silver. So in 2006, he started the second label. Um, so that's kind of a little brief history on it, on who they are. Uh, I've been really excited to try this out. Um, I thought there was something in here, I guess not. Maybe on the, uh, the 2011 there was something there, but that's the basic upshot of this wine, okay? So I'm excited to try this out. So really golden color. So not as, not as gold as this, as the uh, um, cul-de-sac, but definitely a very deep gold color, okay? So this is one of those where you kind of, you saw it in a glass, if you're blind tasting, you're kind of like, it can only be Chardonnay, but you but you know that you can't just judge it from that because it could be something else. It could be, it could be Viognier, um, it could be Marsan Rousson, it could be a number of other uh, other white uh, wines, but it just looks so gold that you're kind of like, it's Chardonnay, okay? You definitely not mistake it for Sauvignon Blanc or Pinot Grigio if you looked at it. Could even be a very, very rich Riesling. Okay, so off the nose, not a whole lot coming out of the nose, so it's not, it's not, uh, it's not uh, highly aromatic. I was kind of hoping it would be a little more aromatic than it is. Now I don't get a lot of apple on it, which is what I should. Um, Wait a minute, I don't know if they actually go through malolactic. Yeah, no malolactic fermentation, okay. So I shouldn't get any buttered popcorn out of it. But I do get something out of it. And it's not the apples. But I can't quite pin down exactly what I'm getting out of it. But it's definitely, um, there's a bit of fruit to it, not a lot of floral. No wood, obviously it shouldn't be, and I don't get any earthiness out of it. Really, the closest thing I equate this is is, is pasta, is a is a breadiness out of it. Honestly, not quite seafood, but. Maybe a slight minerality of, of, of rockiness, but it, it's, it's so aloof, it's like, it's like a little bit, no, yet, no, yet, no, you know, it's like, oh, no, I get it, no, I don't, so. It's one of those smells that I, I can't quite identify, but I know it, all right? So let's just taste it. There we go. Finally, getting those apple type of flavors. Now, I know I'm seeing a gold color, so I'm thinking golden apple, but definitely an apple flavor to it. The initial flavor, though, was I was getting kind of this, made me think of Chinese restaurants. So 
the problem is that Chardonnays and Viognier's in general are what I would drink at Chinese restaurants, specifically P.F. Chang's. I ate at P.F. Chang's all the time in Chicago because it was across the street from where I worked at ESPN Zone. So after work, if I worked a day shift, I'd go there for dinner. And I would have a white wine a lot of times with what I was, what I was eating. So this style of Chardonnay is what I associate with eating Chinese food with. So that's why I get this, I'll sometimes say, oh, it's like Chinese, makes me think of a Chinese restaurant. Now, despite the fact that no malolactic fermentation happened, and let's go over malolactic. Well, we're going to go over malolactic in the next segment, so don't worry about it. If you want to know what it is, got to keep watching if you don't already know. And if you do know, then you're going to watch see if I get it right. But um, despite the lack of malolactic fermentation, um, the apple flavors are not super strong. Um, I've had some other wines that, that don't go through mallow and you really get the, the apple flavor, even the green apple. With that said, I get a good acidity to it. Um, there's a bit of, it feels like the mouth is coated a little bit. Um, I feel like I get some more banana and tropical fruit flavor out of it. I wouldn't say necessarily say pineapple, but it makes me think of those things. Maybe even maybe even kind of like a pineapple or or a, again things that I could associate with some sauces in a Chinese restaurant, like a like a, a not quite a sweet and sour sauce, but those types of flavor profiles that that I can see certain Chinese dishes working really well with this. Um, which the problem is like when I talked about blind tasting, is this could be something that would make me think of Viognier rather than Chardonnay at first, okay? <clears throat> There's a bit of, I don't want to say oiliness to it, but but feels like it coats the mouth a little bit. Again, I've associated that with Viognier too. So this is one of those where if I was blind tasting, I could see myself going down both paths and then picking one over the other, and I might be right half the time and wrong half the time. So But definitely the apples, it's there, a golden apple type of thing. More than that, more than really any other flavor. Um, and a good acidity to it. And just an overall just nice mouthfeel. It's, it's, it's not really super high acidity to it so that you don't feel like your, your face is getting ripped off with acid. It's got a great mouthfeel to it. It's, it's smooth. Um, it's not hot. Um, it's... There, there's, there's a bit of silkiness to it, I guess, and elegance to it that, that I wouldn't necessarily think about with a white wine, but it's, it's definitely tasty. I definitely recommend it. Um, it's definitely different than this one. Um, this one's a much lighter, but it was, I think it was because I knew what it was and I knew how much I paid for it. I was really, really surprised by it. Whereas this one, it's meeting my expectations. It's, it's meeting my expectations for a $20 bottle of Chardonnay. A $20 bottle of Chardonnay that's unoaked. So it's fulfilling everything that I want out of, out of it and then some. So I definitely recommend it. The finish is still going on. I can still taste it. We're talking a couple minutes later. I'm still tasting the wine. So another, another indicator of, of a wine that's good quality. The only negative I have out of it is it all really gets the apple flavor. I don't get any, I don't get a lot of secondary flavors out of it. So that's just could be me. It could be just my palate. It could be just my what's going on. But I get the acidity and I get the apple. I think that light's about to go out. Outstanding. All right. So let's wrap this up. Cool. Only ten minutes. And let's now talk about all about Chardonnay. I'm gonna move stuff out of the way. All right. So. Let's talk about Chardonnay. All about Chardonnay, right? So um, let's talk about where did it come from. So Chardonnay is one of those old world, old world, ooh, that light's about to go out first. I can see all the individual things in it. This one's just flickering. 
It's also been on the longest. Anyway, that's fine. If it goes out, it goes out. We're, we'll just deal with it. Um, anyway, I can increase the exposure a little bit with the, with the camera. Uh, it's native to France. Uh, it is the child, it's the love child of Gouet Blanc and Pinot Noir. Believe it or not, Pinot Noir. It gets its name from the Chardonnay community, uh, the commune Chardonnay, uh, which is in Burgundy. It's kind of in the heart of Burgundy. Um, it is one of the most iconic grapes out there. Um, it is, it's uh, grown all over the place. It's one of those, like Cabernet Sauvignon, just grown everywhere. But let's, uh, let's talk, we're talking about origins. So it's from France, uh, Burgundy area. Um, it is, in Burgundy you have effectively just Chardonnay or just Pinot Noir. There are a couple other grapes that are allowed to be grown there, but the amount of production that they have is so minimal that at this, at this level, we don't have to worry about it, okay? Um, so uh, there are four areas in Burgundy that are well, uh, in the heart of Burgundy that are, that are known for Chardonnay production. That's, uh, I'm sorry, not the heart, but four areas in the Burgundy Appalachian, or AVA, or no, AOC. Uh, you have Chablis, which is up to the north. They have the Cote d'Or, the Cote Chalonnay, and the, uh, the Mekong, okay? In Chablis, their typical uh, style is very little to little or no or very little oak. Uh, so you'll get, if you, someone says that I have a Chablis style wine, they're, they're saying that they didn't have any oak or if they did, it was very little, maybe it was neutral oak, but the oak wasn't used to, to um, impart anything to the wine, any characteristics of the wine. They tend to have a flinty, steely quality and they tend to have high acid, but not a lot of fruit to it, okay? <sighs> anyway, um, I didn't get much flinty out of that, but that's okay. Uh, and the Cote d'Or, um, the Cote d'Or is, is uh, broken up into two areas. You have the Cote de Nuit and the Cote de Bone. The Cote de Bone is really where Chardonnay and, and the Cote d'Or is, is done. There are eight Grand Cru vineyards uh, in, in the Cote de Bone uh, or the Cote d'Or. Uh, and they are, the group of them are the Montrachet. So if you see a white wine that says Montrachet, on it, you're probably gonna get a good quality Chardonnay out of it. Uh, they're considered the benchmark for the terroir, for the expression of the terroir. Uh, you also have Charlemagne, Corton Charlemagne, and Le Moussini. Moussini. Oh, I, I, I think I just butchered that. But if you have anything, especially with, with Burgundy, as you get, if you have like, if it just says uh, Cote de Bone Chardonnay, it's, it's kind of a basic Chardonnay. And as you get more and more, it says Montrachet, and it starts talking about maybe vineyard or, or specific specific sites, then you start getting higher, higher quality, and then also more expensive, way out of my price range. On uh, the Coast Chalonnay, uh, these are the areas you want to look for. Mercury, Montaigne, Le Bouxy, Bouxy, I guess, Bouxy, and Rouli. Um, and the Mackinac, or Mekon area, uh, Mekon and Puy Fousse. So there's Puy Fousse, Fousse, and Puy Fumé. Puy Fumé is in the Loire Valley, in a completely different grape, okay? Puy Fousse is what uh, is made from Chardonnay. Um, that was one of those catchphrases, those, those hot words a while back. You know, we have Puy Fousse, okay? So um, those are the areas in France that you want to look at. Then, they also make, they use Chardonnay in other places in France. Uh, Champagne. Oh yeah, Champagne's not the name of the grape. Champagne is made from one, one two or three of, the, of certain grapes. Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Pinot Meunier. Um, you also have Champagne called Blanc de Blanc. It means it's the white from the white, white out of white, okay? The, the of the three grapes, Chardonnay is the only, quote, white grape or yellow or green grape, whatever they actually call it over there. Um, and the thing about Champagne is that the wines there, they have a hard time ripening, fully ripening, because they're so far north. You're right, they're right around the 50th parallel. Anything above the 50th parallel gets really difficult to fully ripen the grapes. Doesn't mean you can't ripen the grapes, you can't make wine from them, but you have to have a lot of help from, the, from a lot of other factors, okay? to make good wine out of it. So as a, as a result, the still wines from Champagne were not considered very good. So the carbonation, 
the the bubbles in it are what give that grape the, the wines their their special flavor and 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 their whatever not mystery but make them what they are okay so uh the wine the 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 the, the grapes are rarely harvested fully ripe um so that's okay in in this sense because they're going to make they're going to make um uh, champagne out of it now also in france there's other areas they grow the wine they grow the grape uh, the Languedoc, Alsace, uh, Ardèche, the Jura, the Savoie, and in the Loire Valley too. All right, so let's move over to the New World, or actually more specifically the United States. So California, it is the most widely, most, the most planted white variety in California. Um, it, California has gotten to be known for Chardonnay, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Pinot Noir a little bit, yeah. Zinfandel, okay? But Chardonnay and Cabernet Sauvignon are the two grapes that everybody knows about from California. Um, it's also well planted a lot in Oregon, believe it or not. Um, you know, we don't talk about it, Oregon Chardonnays a lot. We talk about Pinot Gris and from Oregon as far as white wines and red wines, Pinot Noir, but they do grow other grapes there, by the way. Uh, Texas grows a lot of Chardonnay. A lot of debate whether or not Texas should be growing Chardonnay, but you know what? Texas is a really big state. There's areas in Texas that probably Chardonnay does really well and make really good wines. And other parts of the state that they grow it because they're trying to make money and it's not the best grape to grow, but people don't know the word Viognier, okay? Washington, wow, I misspelled Washington on the actual thing. Um, Washington and um, apparently Virginia. I didn't realize there was, I mean, it's, it's grown everywhere, okay? It's grown in every, probably every state has it, but there's a significant amount of uh, Virginia Chardonnay. Uh, let's talk about California again. So California actually is really known for more of the butteriness, you know, those the buttered popcorn, which, you know, had its, man, it had its heyday. I mean, people loved it. They ate it up. It was awesome. And then you had the backlash that really kind of got people back into the unoaked or naked Chardonnay, okay? Uh, Sonoma AVAs actually create more than Napa Valley. They uh, do a Burgundian style, okay? And uh, the, the sub-AVAs you want to look for, Alexander Valley, Los Caneros, the Santa Maria Valley, and the Russian River Valley. Now, Napa Valley also makes it, Monterey County, Santa Barbara County, the Central Valley, Central Valley, they have a ton of it. The Central Valley, that's like the most fertile land in California. They grow everything there. You know, they grow apples and wheat and grapes and regular grapes, table grapes and, oh, did I say apples? Everything, there's cattle there. I mean, it's, it is such a fertile valley and they grow tons of stuff. That's great for most agriculture. It's, I'm gonna say it's bad for wine, but it's not gonna give you top quality wine. It's gonna get you wine that's drinkable. Okay, I'm not saying this is from Central Valley, but it is a California wine, and they get a lot of bulk wine from there. So other New World, um, well, there's, everywhere grows it, but some countries of note, okay, that, that, that produce some Chardonnay that's pretty decent. Australia, Australia's really gotten a good reputation with their Chardonnay. Uh, New Zealand, um, another country that, again, we don't think about New Zealand right now as having a lot of Chardonnay. It's more Sauvignon Blanc, and on the red side, Pinot Noir is really starting to take hold, or not start, but becoming, uh, they're becoming known for that. Italy. Yeah, I had an episode recently where I said, yeah, Italian wine, Chardonnay, I would never probably, just in general, I'd be kind of like, uh, discount it, right? But Italy has a lot of Chardonnay grown in there, especially in the southern part. Um, in Puglia, where the wines were from. South Africa, South America, and Canada, eh? They actually grow some Chardonnay up there. They grow a lot of stuff up there. Uh, let's talk about Australia and New Zealand real quick. So it became really popular in Australia, in Australia itself in the 50s. Uh, then in the 80s and 90s, a huge push, the export, to you know, exporting the wine out to the, to, to the world, especially the United States. Uh, it was very fruity, um, very had a lot of acidification to it, so they add, so they, they added acid to it, uh, and they would use wood chips to instead of wood barrels because you know they're trying to make a lot of this wine, and wood chips is kind of like that inexpensive way to add wood characteristics to a wine without having wood barrels. Um, 
So they had these, you know, the critter wines, okay? We're talking about the yellowtail and all the, all the other wines that had, you know, animals on it to sell. Oh, Americans love that stuff, right? Um, so you had the big push in the 80s and 90s. Uh, it was also, for New Zealand, the most planted varietal until 2002. So, I mean, since I really started getting into wine, all I hear about is New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. Well, prior to 2002, Sauvignon Blanc wasn't the, wasn't the king of the hill, you know, as far as the white grape varieties. Italy and South Africa. Okay, so Italy. So, like I said, they planted a lot of this stuff. Um, and it got confused with Pinot Blanc. Um, it... it it apparently looks very much like it. The leaves look very similar. Um, so without doing DNA testing, they thought it was Pinot, Pinot Blanc. Uh, it's used a lot for blending. So like I said, seeing Italian Chardonnay, well, I'm not saying is, is unusual or rare, but it's typically used to blend with other grapes. Uh, South Africa. Um, the funny story about South Africa, it was smuggled into the country. So it, they, they weren't, you know, I guess there was a law against importing you know, which there's actually a lot of laws about that, of taking, you know, clippings and, 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 and plants uh, or even animals from another country into another, especially if we're talking about changing continents. Um, so that's what happened. It got smuggled into the country. Um, it was actually another grape. Uh, they thought it was Chardonnay, but it was actually a grape called Oxera, Oxera uh, Blanc. Uh, and it is actually the third most planted grape in general. In South Africa. All right, malolactic and oak. So we kind of talk about malolactic uh, in the uh, in the reviews. Malolactic fermentation. This is what it does. It takes malic acid, the mallow part, and converts the, the bacteria. Okay, uh, convert it into uh, lactic acid. So what you do is you go from an, uh, a wine that'll have more of an apple flavor to it into something that'll be a buttery flavor, lactic acid. That's the, that's the acid that's in milk or in dairy. Um, this fermentation uh, is sometimes done on purpose. Sometimes it's done accidentally. I mean, the history of champagne is, is where this malolactic fermentation came from. It was a second ferment. They called it a second fermentation. Uh, so you'll hear second fermentation uh, and mal malolactic fermentation kind of inter interchanged because the malolactic fermentation that was happening in these wines is, the, is what the second, ferm well, the second fermentation was the malolactic. Um, what was happening is that the wines were getting too cold for the bacteria to interact with the malic acid to convert it into lactic, so it would be dormant, and then it would eventually uh, get warmer, and you'd have the second fermentation happening in a bottle, and then the bottles explode. Not a good thing in a cellar. Um, oak or not to oak? Okay, so you can do malolactic fermentation and then age it in concrete or stainless steel if you want, but they typically put it in oak. Uh, oak will impart certain characteristics to it. So you'll have caramel, you'll get spices. So typically like your, what we call Christmas spices. So like your nutmeg, um, not spices as in pepper. Um, vanilla and you get a creaminess to it. Uh, and and this, is, this is what especially the American palate in the 80s and 90s, uh, as far as you know, the California Chardonnays was, was so going after. Now you've got, like I said, a backlash where people are kind of not getting into it as much. It's not really in, the, it's not really in my presentation here. Chardonnay is, is one of the most planted grapes in the world. It's, it's easy to plant. It grows really well. Um, if you have a fertile area, it will grow like a mofo. Not that none of the other grapes will, I mean, a lot of them will, but some grapes tend to, tend to grow better than others. Um, it's, it's, not a, it's not a finicky grape as far as the winemaking process is concerned. So you have, winemakers will do it. And plus, as far as like, especially if you're trying a new winery and they need, they need grapes, they're, they're gonna do their own stuff. Chardonnay is one of the names that everybody knows. That's one of the things about, especially industries like Texas, and we're not the only one that does this, but you have a lot of people that say, you know what, Texas should not stop growing Chardonnay and Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot it doesn't, and Sauvignon Blanc because those are not grapes that are suited to Texas climate. Hey, dude, you know what? Whatever, man. We are a southern climate, okay? Uh, we are the equivalent of something like Italy, in, in southern Italy in climate. 
uh, in general. But you know, you go to the high plains, it gets freaking cold up there, dude. We're talking like zero degrees and 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 snow drifts. Okay, so and during the summer it gets hot, very hot. So. While there is some truth of the matter that there are areas in Texas that are not conducive to things like Chardonnay uh, or even Cabernet Sauvignon and uh, Merlot, it doesn't mean you can't grow those grapes in Texas and make a good wine out of it. You know, my personal opinion is a lot of other grapes you can grow, which there are a lot of winemakers now doing that, which is great. So over the next couple of decades, we're going to see what happens. We'll see if Texas shifts to more of the different varietals or does it, or, or does it find a happy balance, a happy medium between all of the varietals? Anyway, so as far as Chardonnay, um, it's one of the kings. It's one of the, the big grapes out there. Um, some people love it, some people hate it. There was the anything but Chardonnay movement, the ABC, for a while, um, because it got so passe, I guess. Kind of like Merlot, you know, became the, the, bad, the bad wine to drink, and Pinot Noir became the great the great wine to drink from Sideways. So uh, check it out. We know that I'm not a huge fan of Chardonnay, but I enjoy Chardonnays. Both of these that I had today, I liked. Um, they both have different, uh, they have different aspects to it. Um, I like the cul-de-sac really because it's so inexpensive. And it's like, well, I mean, you can't, it's kind of like how can you go wrong with it? I like the silver because it is a definitely a better quality Chardonnay. Um, and it's, something that I could totally enjoy on a different level. So that's gonna do it for uh, today's episode. Uh, I really appreciate you all stopping by. Uh, that light's actually still on, believe it or not. And uh, friend me up, you know, click the links above to friend me up, hit the link over here uh, to uh, help me buy some more wine. Tell your friends about it, subscribe to iTunes, what else? Uh, just spread the word. Uh, and uh, I'll see everybody in Texas, who's going, because that's the week that this is out. And we'll see everyone again next time.